Thank you. So thank you very much for inviting us. We're delighted to be here because you are our audience for the film, which is great. So I'm Sandy McBride, and I'm a dermatologist at the Royal Free, and um, I lead with Mark Griffiths, quite a big psoriasis service. And as Richard said, we try to have quite a patient-centred service, and we also work with rheumatologists, but importantly, a psychologist called Alex Mazzara, who has absolutely opened our eyes to what it's like to experience psoriasis. And so I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes, and then Sarah Sutcliffe, who's a professional storyteller, is going to talk after me, and then we're going to show you the film, which is 11 minutes long, and we'll be really interested to hear your thoughts on it and obviously answer any questions that you have. So as Carla said, um, the film which is called um, Psoriasis, The Skin I'm In, which is also a live performance actually as well, was developed as part of See Psoriasis Look Deeper. And for those of you who haven't heard of it, it's a collaboration between the Psoriasis Association and the Mental Health Foundation, but also um, Chris Bundy, who's on the right here, who's a psychologist from Manchester. She works with Richard Warren and Toby Haydoke, who's a comedian and writer and actor, and he also has psoriasis, and it comes to the Royal Free for his psoriasis, and then myself. And as Carla said, that we aim with this collaboration to raise awareness of what it's actually like to have psoriasis and the wider life impact of it. So this project was born out of frustration. So initially, well, mainly our frustration and frustration on your behalf. So often when we do the new patient clinic, people have had psoriasis for 10, 20, 30, 40 years before they've ever come to see a dermatologist and before they have access to treatments. And often when they come and we say, you know, we can get you better, it's the first time they've ever heard this. And frequently they're told that there's no cure for psoriasis and that for psoriasis means that there's no treatment. So it's this urban myth gets perpetuated um, by all the people it seems that come into contact with people with psoriasis. And what happens is that people then, which I'm sure many of you can relate to, make decisions based on having psoriasis so their lives become altered and perhaps people make decisions that they wouldn't have done if they didn't have psoriasis or if their psoriasis wasn't as bad. And then that is, it's really frustrating when then you come to see a dermatologist who says, actually, you can get better. It's like, why wasn't I told this sort of 10, 20 years ago? So that's what triggered us into doing a health-seeking study. So we interviewed people with psoriasis to ask them what drove them to seek help for their psoriasis. And it was quite interesting findings. And in this group of people, it was 15 years on average before they'd seen a, a dermatologist. And a lot of people develop psoriasis in their late teens, early 20s. They're really key years to be living with psoriasis, often unnecessarily. And people didn't know. So, so you are an educated group of people with psoriasis here today, but many people aren't aware that there are actually treatments for psoriasis and have been frequently told this as well over many, many years. And we identified in that study a pattern of health-seeking behaviour, which, so health-seeking behaviour is where you go to get help for your psoriasis. You might go to your GP, you might not. And what we found was that there was a common pattern with all the people that we interviewed of the onset of psoriasis, followed by a a trial and error phase, an acceptance phase, and then a reactive health-seeking phase. So in the onset, so when people first get psoriasis, and this may be true of you, I don't know, but that they tend to like seek help for it. So, and, and the help depends on friends and family. So in, in people who develop psoriasis, whose family members also have psoriasis, often they don't see a GP, but they'll get creams from family um, members who kind of have some expertise in it but people who don't have family members with psoriasis often they're triggered by family and friends to seek help so if someone says look go go to your gp about this go and get some help then they will and and then they rapidly seek help 
So there's a little window of opportunity there in order to make a change. But after this, people are given loads of creams. They're not properly explained to how to use them. So many people, like people take photographs of cupboards full of creams, bags full of creams, not really knowing where to put them, what to do with them. And they get frustrated, understandably, with it. But also by being underestimated. So when they go and see GPs or dermatologists, often GPs, dermatologists, don't actually recognise what they're going through. And they become really frustrated, which leads to this years and years and years of coping. So people cope in different ways. And Richard alluded to that, I think, when he was answering your question, that you'll recognise people covering up. This time of year is difficult, isn't it, when you have psoriasis, because suddenly your coping mechanism over the winter of wearing your long sleeves and long trousers isn't as appropriate when it gets hotter. And people continue to use ineffective creams, and this incurability is cemented. And this can go on for decades until there's something happens. So either the psoriasis gets really bad, so people are triggered to help, or someone, again, they might see a new GP or they might develop a new friendship, who then they trigger people to seek help. But at that point, doctors are often very, very low down on the list of people you want to go and see because of all the frustrating experiences. And therefore, people go to alternate health seeking um, and often go abroad for help. So that was the findings of this study. And what we really want is for people to have timely, effective treatment. So, so Rich has talked about many of these really effective treatments that are available. But unless you get them, they're not very effective in the box or in the pharmacy. So you need to get to them um, and to do that, it's actually quite complex. So, so partly it depends on you having psoriasis, so um, going to, knowing that they're available so you can ask for them and actually seeing a doctor so that you can get referred for them. But also when you do that, you need to be seeing the right person to be receptive to the fact that you need some treatment. And as we've said, the treatment actually thankfully isn't so difficult anymore. But it's even more complex, isn't it? So it's, it's dependent on what's happening at home, family and friends. The infrastructure, so, so Richard um, was talking about Manchester being a, a big unit. You know, we've got a big unit as well. But if you live somewhere else, it actually can be even harder, can't it, to access help, depending on the medical infrastructure around you and also the political climate. So there's, there's a really big drive politically for cancer, which means that health resources are put into curing cancer and having early access to cancer, whereas people with other conditions, which are inflammatory long-term conditions, often politically there's not the driver to have um, people receiving effective treatment early. So looking at the doctors, healthcare professionals, where does it go wrong? Well, I talk quite a lot about the things that we do at the Royal Free, and there are common themes when challenging other units about what they do. And um, people are scared. So, so this, thing, this fear of opening a can of worms. So, so doctors, we're very good in our own environment. And if we have to come out of that, sometimes it's a little bit scary. So when a patient comes to you, you want to, to act within your um, safety comfort zone, which is about being in control and not particularly asking what people want. And you look at someone and you make a decision as to kind of how bad their psoriasis is and what they need. And that may actually be totally different to what the person wants or feels they need. So there's a fear of actually going outside the box and also a fear of asking people about emotional issues as well. So they feel that they don't have the skills Lack of time is a massive thing. And also, sometimes people who deal with people with skin conditions, they think, right, I'll deal with the skin, but nothing else. And as we've heard today, there's a lot more to psoriasis than just the skin. And we're really bad about picking up distress, particularly in people with psoriasis, so that, so that we find it really difficult to recognize when somebody is upset or that, that their psoriasis is having a big effect on their lives. And again, as Richard alluded to, psoriasis is a long-term condition. But how many times have you been to see someone, they give you a cream, and then they never arrange to follow you up, that's it. And yet, you know, this is a long-term condition. If 
you had diabetes, it would be an absolutely different ball game or high blood pressure. But because it's the skin, it, the importance is diminished. And this mismatch means that there's often frustration, which means that people with psoriasis, because their experience is very different to the way that the doctor or the nurse that they're seeing um, is responding. So you're really struggling, and yet the doctor or the nurse is absolutely diminishing what you have and doesn't recognise that you need to be treated. And understandably, there's frustration, and also then people find it difficult to do what they're being advised to do because they don't trust the person who they're seeing. So there's two sides to every coin, isn't it? So I think there's, a, there's you know, we actually find it quite difficult, but there are particular attributes of people with psoriasis that also contribute to it. And I don't know if some of you might recognise these things, and these are partly from some other studies we've done. Um, so people with psoriasis often find it difficult to talk about emotions. Is this, are there family and friends here of people with psoriasis? <laughs> So this is, this is very common, that if you say to somebody with psoriasis, how do you feel? It's a really difficult question to answer. And people in clinic do a classical thing. So if you say, how do you feel? They go like this, because they feel really uncomfortable, because often people don't have the language for emotion. So there's no point in asking the question. Whereas if I were to ask you, how's your life affected by psoriasis, or how would your life be different if you didn't have psoriasis, it would be a much easier question to answer. And that means it's really difficult for doctors to pick up actually how you're feeling. And the other thing is that people with psoriasis think something bad is going to happen. So even if there are treatments available, they think that that, that it won't work for them or there'll be a problem with it. So, so one of my patients, who's, who's a very eminent businessman, he says that every time he drives home, he thinks his house is going to be on fire. And it, it's a problem that even when people are better, they fear getting it coming back. So, so can't enjoy that thing. And, and it's just a way that, that people with psoriasis think. But unless you know that as a clinician, then, then you, you have to be really positive being the doctor with, when suggesting treatments and, and be enthusiastic about it and support people because otherwise they won't work if you don't take them. And the other thing, people with psoriasis tend to find it difficult to ask for help, so which you again might recognise within yourselves that, that you tend to be really self-sufficient and not want to bother anyone else. That's why people with psoriasis are really nice. It's my best clinics, the psoriasis clinics, because um, people find it really difficult and often feel they don't even deserve help. And these beliefs are firmly embedded. So... Simply, doctors often know in theory about treatments, but they don't necessarily act in order for people to get the treatments when they need them. And people with psoriasis are often not aware of available treatments, and they find it difficult to act because of the reasons I've said, and also to communicate actually what they are experiencing and how bad things are for them, which then means that the doctor doesn't act either. So we have an opportunity for change. Nothing is ever as it seems. So, And with that first slide, do you remember we talked about that at the beginning when people actually seek help, I think is a real opportunity for change. And key to that is family and friends as well. So what we thought is people do care. So I don't think doctors don't act because they don't care, which obviously it can seem like that. I think it's because they don't truly understand what it's like. And if we were to educate people as to what it's truly like to have psoriasis and what behaviours from clinicians... And before this project, I had no idea how important the consultation and your, your relationship with doctors is to the individual people till I read the interviews that we did. Um, and, that, and simply that treatments are available... So if we could communicate that treatments are available and what it's like to have psoriasis, I think that both friends and family would act and doctors would act and people with psoriasis would seek help. But to do that, we need an educational tool and we need an educational tool that changes behaviour as well. Um, and it needs to be suitable for a wide audience because we know it's not just 
doctors, it's not just people with psoriasis, it's friends and family as well. And because it's a see psoriasis look deeper initiative, we like it to look pretty and we wanted it to be a piece of art so that it was enjoyable in an aesthetic way um, as well for people. So in thinking about this, what came to mind were Sarah and Danny storytellers, obviously. So I went to see a couple of storytelling performances which Sarah and Danny did here in the film and was absolutely blown away with how they made me feel and also that way of communicating a message. And I wondered whether it would lend itself to communicating the message of what it's like to have psoriasis and that there's treatment available. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah Sutcliffe, who's the storyteller, and she'll tell you her part in the journey. Hello. So I'm Sarah, yes, and as Sandy says, I'm a storyteller. Um, I've got absolutely no medical training whatsoever. Um, I do have an acting training, if that helps. Um, and my role in this project uh, was really to hear people's stories. So, um, you know, we chatted about this idea about uh, telling people's stories, and we thought there really, there's, there's something here we can really we can really do. So um, the idea was for me to uh, talk to people about their stories of what it was like to live with psoriasis, how it affected people's lives. And the stories that I was hearing were often uh, hidden stories, uh, untold stories. Um, and I felt that my job really was to listen to those stories and to absorb them and then find a way as a storyteller to retell them. And obviously I wanted to retell them in a, as truthful and as authentic way as I could, uh, but also in a way that was compelling and emotionally engaging. So um, that was our starting point. Um, I work with stories all the time. Stories are very deeply in our subconscious. We, when we read a book, we read a story. When we watch a film, when we read the newspaper, uh, we, even, we dream in story fragments. So they're very much part of everyone. Uh, everyone can relate to a story. And um, we actually make sense of our existence often through stories. So they're a very powerful tool. Um, there's also some, there is a little bit of science behind it as well. So uh, there's three, I think, three important things uh, to know. Uh, the first is that uh, some studies have shown that stories are actually 22 times more memorable than data. So uh, when we're looking at behavior change and trying to change what people think about something, stories are very powerful. Um, the London Business School did a study uh, where they took a cohort of students and they gave them a PowerPoint presentation full of data. And six days later, they asked those students how much of the data they remembered. And only 5% of them remembered anything. Uh, so then they took that same cohort of students and they told them a story. And they embedded the data in the story. And six days later, 75% of them remembered uh, the story. So we, we know it's effective. Um, there's also been research done on, uh, on brains and scanning brains, and they found that the same parts of the brain light up when somebody hears a story as when they actually do something. Uh, so, for example, if you were uh, smelling a rose, certain parts of your brain would light up. If you were told a story about a rose, that those same parts of your brain would light up. And that's why when you um, watch a film, uh, for example, you might feel frightened or excited as if you are actually doing those things. So again, we know that stories are very powerful. Um, so stories can have a very powerful empathetic response. Um, and what actually happens 
physiologically is that oxytocin is released uh, when we hear a story. And oxytocin is responsible for empathy. So if people hear a story and um, oxytocin is released, um, they feel empathy, so they care. Um, so we have two great things happening when people hear a story is that they care and they remember, um, which are, is exactly what we want if we want to change behaviour. Um, so I came to this project through Sandy. I had absolutely no prior knowledge of psoriasis, and I felt that that was an advantage. I had no preconceptions. I had no expectations. And in a way, I had probably the same misconceptions or ignorance as the general public. And I think that was quite useful uh, for me uh, so that I, I responded in a way that actually a large part of our audience might respond. Um, so what did I do? Um, we had 20 patients and I interviewed them. So I spent about an hour uh, with each person and... Um, the people that I saw were at various stages of their journey. Some people had been uh, diagnosed years ago. Some people were recently diagnosed. Some people had had successful treatment. Some people hadn't. Um, all different ages, ethnicities. Um, uh, as much as possible, we got a, a mixture of people. And through using a, a loosely structured questionnaire, uh, I asked them and we chatted about all different aspects of life. So practical issues, um, emotional impact, sex life, people's beliefs about psoriasis, uh, their interactions with healthcare professionals, all sorts of different things. But the most important thing for me was that I was asking people to tell me their stories, to actually tell me what, what happened. So uh, I wasn't if maybe we could say people feel stigmatized, but I say, well, tell me what happened. Tell me what actually happened that day when you went somewhere and uh, somebody said something to you. I, I, and I got to really hear people's people's stories, and it was uh, in incredibly emotional. Actually, um, uh, you know, w there were often tears um, I, I, as people spoke to me and. People also told me stories that they said to me they had never told before. So they'd never spoken to people about some of the things they told me. So it was a very um, moving experience, actually. And I became very convinced of the need to share those stories and that if people could hear them, then behaviours would change. Um, so as Sandy said, we, we recorded those conversations and they were also transcribed. And then uh, along with Danny, uh, we obviously I'd sat through all those uh, um, conversations, interviews, uh, but then together we listened again or we read through all the transcripts that we had and we drew out common themes. So we looked at where... Um, experiences were shared and we literally actually cut up the transcripts and put them in piles and sort of different piles grew uh, of kind of um, similar experiences and from that we wrote a script um, I think it's really important to say that we, we had no agenda but also there was no agenda set upon us uh, nobody was saying it has to be about this or you have to cover that. Uh, we were really given artistic freedom to respond to the material that we had. So we listened to those stories and we wrote about what we felt were the key issues that were coming out f from those conversations. Um, and, and when we were writing, we actually often used i mean you, you you'll see we we wrote it in verse um uh, that was an artistic choice but um actually quite a lot of the words are, 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 are the real words that people used so obviously we've crafted it and we've put things together but we're actually using a, a lot of people's real um 
real words. Um, so we wrote, we wrote a script, uh, then we, uh, after that, we get together in a rehearsal room. Uh, we brought in a director who is our kind of outside eye, um, and we put that script on its feet. Uh, we also brought in a couple of musicians. Uh, we, as storytellers, we always work with musicians if we can, because musicians bring soul uh, to a story, and they bring emotion. And we felt that was so important to this story because it was so full of emotion. Um, so yeah, we put it on its feet and then uh, made a live performance. So this exists as a live performance as well as a film. And uh, we showed that to some test audiences and got feedback on that just to check what people were getting from it, how they were feeling to make sure we felt that we were representing things in the way that we had wanted to. Um, and then the last part of the process was putting it, making it into a film. Um, and again, we felt very strongly that we wanted to hold on to the artistic element of it, that we wanted to keep it as a storytelling piece. Um, we brought in a fantastic director, Simon Baker, um, and we made this film from it. So uh, we're going to show that now. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, this, is, this is a story that comes from 20, 20 interviews, but hopefully represents the experience of many more people. I want to know what it feels like. I feel like I've been living under a dictatorship for 55 years. Volatile, controlling, oppressive. I've lived like this since I was eight years old. I'm 42. I feel like I'm being followed by a dark presence. I didn't know anything about it till five years ago. It just crept up on me. I'm 16. I think I've been cursed. I feel like a dirty, grubby bug is crawling all over my skin, secreting on me. I'm 29. For me, it's like an old widow dressed in black. It's clinging to my shoulders, refusing to let go, holding me back. We're talking about psoriasis. What even is that? Hard to spell. Hard to say. It's a skin condition, OK? When you rot from the inside, people care. When you rot from the outside, people stare. Are you contagious? Think that's outrageous? I was sitting on the bus a long time ago, dressed from head to toe. I always dressed from head to toe, wouldn't want anything to show. But that day I had it on my hands, thick like the skin of a rhino. This man sits next to me and out of the corner of my eye I see where his gaze lands. Within a second, he's on his feet, down the bus to another seat. That day, I wanted to die. I never take off my top, never wear shorts, no matter how hot. But at centre parks, the kids wanted to swim. They begged and begged me to jump in. So I did. The chlorine made it bright red, but my skin wasn't flaking, no crumbs from my head. There were days when I shed, but not that day. That day, just red on my back and my chest, my legs, knees, and the rest. Anyway, I'm having some fun with the kids when I see the manager walking around the pool. What's wrong with your skin? A psoriasis, I say to him. I give it its name. What even is that? He's not to blame. It's always the same. They don't teach it at school. We've had complaints from other parents. It's not contagious. It won't spread. They'd like you to leave? So I heave myself out of the water, in front of my son and daughter. I feel humiliated, just devastated. But this is what's never stated, how it eats at your soul and your self-esteem. The next day, I buy a full-body wetsuit. And the lifeguard says to me, why are you wearing that? I must have looked like a prat. Whatever you do, you lose. I smiled at him and said, it's to hide the tattoos. My daughter didn't want to kiss me. She's only five. She said, there's something wrong with your face. I went to give her a hug, and she moved her head back, like that. I'm a mother. 
and a wife. I feel guilty I let this affect my life. I won't let him run his hands down my legs. No, not even if he begs. He says he doesn't mind that I'm all scale and rind. But sometimes it's under my breasts, in my crotch, notches and blotches. I don't feel sexy. All through the night, I itch and scratch and rub my feet. When I wake in the morning, there's blood on the sheets. There's handfuls of skin in the cot and the carpet by the beds, white with rotten flakes and scaly scrapes. The grated cheese of the molting disease. I vacuum and clean every day. He says nothing. I mean, what can he say? But one day I gave him a cuddle on the couch and afterwards I spied him wiping it down. He didn't flinch or frown. He just wiped it down. The skin from my crown. What if he leaves me for someone with smooth skin? Someone who lets him in? You're lucky you've got a mate. I'm too scared to date. But hey, it won't kill you, it's psoriasis. Hard to spell. Hard to say. It's a skin condition, okay? At least it's not cancer. You won't die. So hide your sorrows. And try not to cry. You've worked with me for 10 years, sat near for half your career, and yet you had no idea. Do you know why? Because it's hidden under my shirt and tie. It's everywhere except my face. My only saving grace. Yes, I go to the loo more often than you. <laughs> we'll have a laugh with the staff. Make jokes about your secret smokes and your bladder infection. Do you know what I do there? Body correction. I obsessively comb my hair, brush my shoulders clean, rub my skin, apply some cream. And then I'm good for an hour. But when it's bad, I go home for a shower. It's so demeaning, I'm always cleaning. You've no idea how hard I try to hide this affliction, how I lie to keep up the fiction that I'm okay. I'm not okay. I'm not okay. I just can't talk about it because it makes me cry. There are days when I want to die. My doctor said it's in my head, but it's chicken and egg. I didn't get this because I'm stressed. I got it and then got depressed. Well, don't get me started on doctors and GPs. They know even less about it than me. Most of them haven't got a clue. They've no idea what to do. Take this cream. Apply it from head to toe. And it might go. We have a lotion. A potion. A and if that doesn't work, we don't have a notion. It can't be cured. You'll have it for life. Those words stuck in my head like a knife. It was getting worse and worse, like a witch's curse. I'd go back, he'd shrug and sigh like I was wasting his time. You have to get used to it. You're not going to die. I saw GP after GP, but not one of them would refer me. By then, I couldn't cope. I'd, I'd given up hope. They've no idea what you feel inside. I was actually close to suicide. To them, it's just a bit of dry skin, but it's how your mind goes into a spin. It doesn't have to look that bad to drive you completely mad. I was in constant pain, going in, in, insane. I couldn't explain what it was all about. I, I stopped going out. There was no one I could call. I had no one. No one at all. There's no understanding. I hate being demanding, but I had to beg, literally beg, to get a referral. At last, I got to see someone good. Someone who actually understood. The specialist said, We can treat this. I thought they were taking the piss. How does this affect your life? No one had ever asked me how I felt. My heart began to melt. I told them, It's not just my skin. It touches everything. I can't go for a swim. I can't go to the gym. I can't laze on a beach. There's no part of my life this thing doesn't reach. I can't use nice soap because it burns like rope. I shed skin on the loo. I can't use shampoo. There's endless streams of greasy creams. It's not just my skin. It's every relationship I'm in. It's always hurting. I can't go out flirting. I had to tell my lover it's on my vulva. I'm in pain. Can't sleep. There's no part of my life this thing doesn't reach. Don't worry. We can stem the tide. There are things that you've never tried. Treatments that your doctor may not know about or can't prescribe. As the consultant spoke, my confidence grew. I walked outside, sat down and cried. 
I no longer had to hide. He gave me a voice, offered me a choice, let me speak, and the treatment started to work within weeks. Here's what I remember. I saw the specialist sometime in November, and now it was Christmas Eve. I was in the bath and I couldn't believe what I saw. My skin was clear from here to here. It completely gone, not a mark, not a sign. I couldn't believe this body was mine. After 30 years, it was like magic. How could it disappear so quick? Of course, for some, it will take longer. But if someone listens, you feel stronger. And yes, it comes and it goes, but my self-esteem grows. I looked at my skin for what felt like an age. All my life I'd been locked in a cage and someone had opened the gate and all that loathing and self-hate, that weight, that terrible weight just fell away and I felt great. I was free. I shed my old self and now it was me. I want to run naked down the street, hug everyone I meet. If you have psoriasis and your life is in crisis... Or someone you know has a tale of woe... Or you're a GP with patients to see... Don't give up, we can treat it. And yes, we'll, we'll beat, beat it. it. There's no cure, that's for sure. But you need to know, you can make it go. For ten years, I've been more or less free. I control it. It no longer controls me.